prime minister is vacant? The year was 2006. It was Thursday, March 30, 5.10 p.m. In exercise of the power conferred on me by subsection 1 of section 70 of the Constitution of Jamaica, do hereby appoint you, being a member of the House of Representatives, to be Prime Minister. Portia Simpson Miller became the first woman Prime Minister of Jamaica. The Governor General just congratulated Jamaica's seventh Prime Minister, and she's received a standing ovation here at King's House. There it is. I was in tears and I was going on the hall to all the 200-odd women and I was saying, girls, this is a history for all of us as women. This is a moment, regardless of the political side of the, the side of politics that you exist on in Jamaica, this is our moment. This is an important moment. And as young women, I want you to take it in. Sit in this moment and, and recognize this is our first woman prime minister because this is history right here on the grounds of king's house hundreds witnessed the 2006 inauguration of portia simpson miller later we'll examine her performance as prime minister but first the standing ovation and the cheers even from dignitaries characterized the public reception of her throughout her career Crowd hysteria. Well, once she came, there was a frenzy. Progress. The progress step up. It turn up. It turn up. Up, up, up. In the uh, entertainment business, they refer to Elephant Man as the energy god. Yep. Good to go. I think she would have been the energy guard of, of the political platform. It would be like a, a DJ coming on to a, at a song clash or a stage show. And, you know, the, the crowd would just wait for the first word. And if, if there was a frenzy about her. I, I go to a conference and see mothers lining up just to give their babies to her for her to hug. She just had this people skill that... It's not common. She exuded care and concern for the poor. And um, she was one of the most outstanding political representatives that we have had in the country, in my opinion. Portia was a phenomenon. Uh, she has many firsts. And she has really blazed the trail for women. She had a PhD in the craft of politics. Others may have had PhD in other areas, but not in the craft of politics. She wasn't an athlete, but was well known for her running. Once she exited her vehicle, she would run to the stage. Now, this is somebody who would have been, at the time when she was elected, about 60, and even towards the end of her tenure in her late 60s. But Portia looked good. Portia was always well put together, you know, and she was, she was fit, you know. I mean, she would sprint and she would run on to the stage. It's, it's a dread of those of us who are around her, people like me who are overweight and so forth. She'd run up the stairs of the office of the Prime Minister. She never walked up it, not a single day. Do you try to keep up with her? I try, but I lose the race all the time. She's, she's just fit. It's an embarrassing to many of us. You're going to through the airport and yeah, J JFK and um, Comrade Simpson Miller is 15, 20 feet ahead of you continuously. She runs upstairs and you are waiting for the elevator. You're behind her on the stairs trying to come up. Those of us who traveled with her a lot found that it was necessary to run to keep up with her. She has a very famous knee lift that she used to do on, on, on the stage. What and like observing her and observing the reaction? It was remarkable. Comrades, time come to sound the trumpet. It's 
the thing that memories are made of, you know, the, the, the kind of thing that stays etched in your mind. It, it signified, yes, somebody who was fit and ready, but also, um, you know, an energy and, a, and an enthusiasm about what she was going to do and say. And again, I think that was also part of what generated that energy around her. Her appearances were always dramatic. Political theater, if you will. She mastered the craft of politics. Uh, she turned, you know, some people turn politics into a science. She turned politics into an art form. Her stage presence and what many saw as her authenticity endeared her to the public. And not just locally. She was adored by Jamaicans in the diaspora. Everybody here. Aluna Samba was Jamaican High Commissioner to the UK between 2012 and 2016. If we went into a store, let me tell you, it doesn't matter which floor a Jamaican was working on, if they heard that Portia Simpson Miller is in the store, they are leaving their post to come and see her even if it's just a wave. Those reactions weren't limited to Jamaicans. Mrs. Simpson Miller was invited to a reception at Buckingham Palace in 2012 on the eve of the London Olympics. She and I were together and I, across the room from where we were was Prince Harry, Prince William and his wife Kate and another young man who at the time I didn't know who turned out to have been their private secretary. And I said to the PM, there's your friend across the room. And she turned around and she looked at him. And he saw her at the same time. Let me tell you, you ever see people running to each other in slow motion in a movie? That's what I saw. So he was on one side of the room and she was on the other side. And they ran towards each other. And when they met each other, they hugged up and jumped around. You know how children hop up and jump around? That was it. Let me tell you something. People stopped and just watched them. Prince Harry had met Mrs. Simpson Miller on a visit to Jamaica a few months earlier. And she had really made a hit with him. And you could see it. He was just so glad to see her. Other world leaders also admired Mrs. Simpson Miller. There was a point in that room when I kept saying to myself, Arun, you are not in the national stadium. And let me tell you why. I remember there was one leader who turned her own, and I remember she had on a green dress. I'll never forget that. You know, there's some things that just stick in your mind. And she turned her own, and she saw her, and all I heard was, Portia, Portia, Portia. I had to say to myself, you're not in the stadium, because you know in Jamaica you're used to hearing that. I focus on the door. Senator Lambert Brown remembers her 2007 speech at the International Labour Organization in Geneva. When Portia started speaking, her speech was interrupted by applause, punctuated with applause. When she finished speaking, it took probably an hour for her to exit the hall. She has escort from the International Labour Organization to take her out. But every delegation surrounded her, wanted to take photographs with her, loved her. And I think up until recently, interview that she gave during that conference is still being played in the halls of the ILO. It was like magic. It was, people became spellbound listening to her. It, it gave you goose pimples and it made you feel so proud to be Jamaican. And I was so proud to, you know, to have been there to see it. Sometimes I would sit back and I would look and I would say, I wish those Jamaicans who speak so negatively about her could just watch her and could just see how people respond to her. They would see how she understood the issues 
and they will see how she could speak to the issues that relate to whatever the discussion was about. who have been my rock and my support. For the people who elected her to parliament in nine elections from 1976 to 2016, Mrs. Simpson Miller's magnetism went beyond stagecraft. Oh, she come like, I'm a second mother, but I'm true, she never buried me. Isaac Roberts is known to her as Tuffy. She used to send me to her school to a green school. You used to give me lunch money too every week and make it a little collector with that thing here. You would mark on it with the twinkle and then they know the twinkle and I sent this a whole heap of money. We're in the Whitfield Town community, the heart of Southwest St. Andrew. Behind me is a building that for many years was a constituency office for Portia Simpson Miller. In this area, Many saw her as being more than just a member of parliament. But why? Judith Brown is from Alexander Road in the Whitfield Division. She be loved by everybody. She loved the children. She loved them to the baby. Like, them dirty, she pick them up. Sister. Judith's sister, Tamika, also has fond memories. I just turn up with weight. Uh, when everybody I carry down to Whitfield Town, our area is nothing. She believes in we. As an MP, Mrs. Simpson Miller was adamant about the importance of academic advancement. We used to go to Greenwich Primary next door, across over there. So. And the first time, the principal put me out of school about three grade. Tell her, I said, I go for Portia. And she took it for joke and said, What now? And when I go up there, I go to, go to the boss and tell her, I said, Mom, Principal put me out of school, you know. She said, you want to go back to school? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, them time there, I want a yellow ladder she have. And we jump in the yellow ladder and come back down to school. And principal see her and say, she frightened because she couldn't believe her. And I said, oh, Miss Portia, this boy is giving me trouble in her the first time that she ever said to me, say, Tough, you know, be yourself, I go and thump in your mouth the next time I hear giving problem. She said, me, I got Rose Leon for the ear. But you mean I'm not like me, me know what? It's like my mind not steady. Me just not, not see myself, me just not do it. Cause every time I say I want to sell, she said I got to sell. And she said, I want to take care of her at town. Do something different. I want to learn a trade and she came and got a rose in her car. And I pay for the six months and buy every equipment. But you know, throw me and holy. She said, okay, I'm saying, close the clothes. Judith. Didn't pursue further education, but still received support. Every um holiday, as she met my people, them can go out. Every every I like back to school, as she everything, as she she's like my man, like I my baby father, like as she breed me, because she when me all when time all not now go on and me call her, she never let me down. You got woman that send send holy for you go schools, universities. We get doctors, we get liars out here. Where she send when me know. And I'll ask me, ask nobody. And when me know one of my ch ch child passes exam, we didn't have help. We didn't have it. And I went to her and she assisted me. Melanie Walker is Jamaica's 400 meter hurdles Olympic champion. Melanie Walker is my daughter. And Portia was like a godmother to her. In, when she was going to school and things like that at St. Diego, Portia was there for her. Portia, just like my daughter, she had done a lot for parents like me. Her colleagues say she preferred to help people privately without publicity. You may say, well, these are Prime Minister. Here's some things you have done for the part program and people and part program. We think you should advertise it, something that this government does very well. She said, no, these people who have assisted them have dignity, and we should respect their dignity and not be plastered in their face all over the place, just a political mileage. So in other words, somebody shouldn't be seen down the road tomorrow and say, oh, that was a part program person. That person needed help. 
That's not kosher. Many things were taken care of quietly. That's another thing that I really, really admire about her. She always used to say, and especially when we had activities with Path and Path emerged, um, that people must be afforded their dignity. So if you have someone who is getting a grant from Path, no one must know about it. If, yeah, don't broadcast that information. On reflection, she now has mixed feelings. I'm wondering if we should have been more open and should have been more explicit about um, small, you know, some of the smaller things that we did that we didn't, you know, necessarily think were, you know, as important for, for, for the public gaze. Mrs. Simpson Miller was also a pillar of support for families affected by gang violence. Tracy Ann is from Alexander Road. Her family dwelling was set ablaze and destroyed in an apparent reprisal. She know what, what, what happened and she told the guys that can she hear information about their coming back. So we have to move and she hear that and she go down there and she tell them say, listen, if you don't touch them again, you never to show the right side of me. So we realized that she loved us so we gave her that same love. Uh, what a night she come down here. If the she says something happens, me mean me, 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 me talk me talk and the truth. I want to talk, me talk, me tell her when me know she left her house and hours a night and come down here. If she says something happen to some people, but she knows say yeah, no right. If she is a violent flee up in the community, she come out and she make sure go and make sure she always make them know say I hear me. And that you want for her community. He recalls how she became the main caregiver for an orphan. I tried to take place down a Greenwich farm at the train line. Them killed about seven people. I don't know who could happen, but it's 7 p.m. I left all the kids there and a couple of people left. And she take, she go move them herself and put them in her yard right beside her office. And there was one special girl, I believe. Fair mother did fair parents are dead. And she take that girl left. Take her, I mean, take her off as her, as her daughter. So I know she have her heart. Real people's heart. Our oh, children are dear to my heart. She had a special Thank love for children. To the hearts of Jamaicans. The Bible declares that children are a blessing from the Lord. They embody the present and represent the future. So there are times when you're going uh, out of town and you may have been in the helicopter and usually you land on like a school field and they clear the field and the children would be behind a fence or something that would be, you know, safe and, and away. And there was a time when the um, JDF actually um, used to land as far away from the fence line as possible so as not to, um, the dust, she ensured, she would say to them, don't go near the children, you're going to get the dust on the children, but those children, they stood uh, um, behind the wall and they would scream at her and they would scream Porsche. They used to call her Porsche. I don't, I don't know if, how it got around the entire country, but everywhere she went, the children were calling her Porsche, Porsche, Porsche. And they would reach and stretch for her and she would go and she would, if, if there were 20 of them, she was going to kiss every single one. Her constituents insisted she remembered all the children she met. Paul Williamson is a community leader. No matter what your child looks like, she'll hug up you, she'll lift your child, she'll hug your child, she'll kiss your child. And that's not just the end of the journey. If and when she see you, she would ask, Do you remember that child that I lift up some time ago? You, you know where that child lives? And if it is even to assist with the child's school fee. For your once go to her, I say, pick it now, of food. Remember, she had give it for even her last, she didn't have a child by right. Because she loved children bad. as a member of parliament, Mrs. Simpson Miller was often criticized for the poor infrastructure and living conditions in her constituency. But the residents are proud of the housing projects built in her years as prime minister. Caribbean Palms is one of three similar projects. I am the proud owner of a house now 
with it is through her initiative. She fight for Billy. And she says she now go left until she give her so much to live. And she really do it. So uh, people who cannot afford could have somewhere to live. Yeah, understand? So I would say thumbs up for that. But those aren't the only reasons constituents give her thumbs up. To them, she was always accessible, even when she became Prime Minister. She actually in her office every day. Okay? And God here, I remember we had a little girl with every part of office. So we know, say, from both, not, not if I talk from me, I look a bit, but from me and seven, I remember, we always up her office. So we know she not left way out, and she walked the road. That accessibility, though, meant sometimes meetings had to be stopped to accommodate constituents. While our ministry, local government, was on Agri Park Road, there are three little boys from Walton Park Road who come and visit her at her office. And she helped them with lunch money and so forth. Then she became Prime Minister, moved from Agri Park to Jamaica House. One Friday, we were there preparing budget speech. She got a call from this police at the gate. These three little boys were there, they were not properly dressed. Police had to send them away to get properly dressed. They came back and they called and said, the boys are back. She invited them into the conference room of Jamaica of the Office of the Prime Minister. Her accessibility sometimes hindered ministerial work. Her notion was that I am a representative of the people and anyone must be able to come to my office and see me. And sometimes there were crowds of people, particularly on, on, on the day that she had, she had put aside for um, people to come and see her. There were crowds in the offices because she would touch everyone and she would see everyone and she would listen to everyone. And it, it did cause a, a challenge because sometimes there were these huge crowds, you know, in the Ministry of Tourism, which was not accustomed to that capacity or in the Ministry of Labour. Her supporters within the People's National Party were also fiercely loyal. A very, very critical element from which she benefited was her way of relating to people. Uh, it's difficult not to love her, even if you disagree with her. To know her is to love her. Really and truly, to know her is to love her. Her rapport with supporters caused challenges for her team, though. Peter Bunting served as PNP General Secretary from 2008 to 2014. We had a very hectic schedule in terms of stopping and having meetings, sort of spot meetings at various town centers. Um, and we were literally trying to do the whole island in two or three days. And so I had, you know, I had a very detailed 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there. We had people drive the route in front of us, you know, the exact transit times, etc. And I remember <laughs> trying to, to, to keep us on that schedule during that, that time and it was that, that was very challenging. I remember a few um, a little colorful language being used on that on that bus tour. Party members insist her support went beyond politics. Floyd Morris was Jamaica's first blind president of the Senate. When anybody there tried to use my disability against me, she was there like a Gibraltar rock to defend and stand um, to my defense. Prime Minister Holness recalls her reaching out to him at a difficult time. I remember um, when she just became Prime Minister and we were going through some transitions as well. You know, um, you know, she, she literally sent someone to, to talk to me to say, hey, why not come over? And that's, a, again, another part of statecraft. So she was always reaching out. Despite bitter internal election campaigns, her colleagues insist she was never personally vindictive. 
She told Lavina's Erika Virtue in a 2016 interview, Just look at my cabinet. I did not appoint only persons who supported Portia. I appointed people from all divide in the party to serve in the cabinet of the country. When she ran to replace um, PJ Patterson, I didn't support her. But you know, when she won, it made no difference. She named me to the cabinet again. Yeah, there was never any problem in that regard. Never any problem. As I said, we had, and I always felt, uh, you know, that I had free access to put my views, to put my views collectively, to put my views privately when it was called upon. The GMP was acutely aware that even die-hard JLP supporters adored Mrs. Simpson Miller. We were hearing on, on, on in the interviews that radio stations were doing. I mean, people say, well, I'm a labor right, but me love Sister P. So I understood at that time how potentially effective Portia could be. Um, Campaigning against her was not easy because you have to understand, you know, she enjoyed a popularity that ranked with and perhaps even exceeded what Michael Mandy enjoyed back in his heyday. The JLP's thought brass, along with overseas marketing experts, had an election strategy retreat here at this hotel back in 2006. It was the weekend of the PNP presidential election runoff which Portia Simpson Miller won. And I After she was declared the winner, we went back in to continue. And the chief guy from abroad, who was, I don't know if he had been to Jamaica before, but he was in Jamaica. He said, Mr. Golding, I have a lot more stuff that I prepared that I wanted to go through. But after watching what I saw on television, I'm going to abandon that. I don't think we have time for that. My advice to you is get to your base. That lady is dangerous. That lady will erode your base. Get to your base. Mrs. Simpson Miller often describes herself as a little girl from Woodhall. So how did a girl from a small rural community grow up to become the politician known as Mama P and Jamaica's first woman prime minister? And what role, if any, did her upbringing play in shaping her? We've come to the place where she grew up. Woodhall, St. Catherine. After many stops, and directions. All right, we're sick, eh? A phone. Mm -hmm. We found Uncle Sam. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if I had the same grade, but we rise the same school. Although it was more than half a century ago, he remembers her growing up. First thing, then then the mother and father then then go go out in the way, in the way like you know then you know, have very privilege that said when you anything like an island there. He recalls her aura even in primary school. He, he just come in like in band for the purpose, well, you know. Yes, yes, a warrior man, warrior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did he stay when she younger? Love me, love me, until okay, nice, nice, nice young lady when I'm coming on. After being lost a few times, we eventually found where she lived. Mrs. Simpson Miller speaks fondly of her parents. From her mother, she learned care and humility. From her father, politics. I remember coming from primary school, my father called me. He said, sit right here on my knees. He rubbed my head and he said to me, I just want you to know you will be the one to bring honor and glory to this family. 
The interest her father sparked in Woodhall ignited her desire to enter politics. She was elected councillor of the Whitfield Division in the constituency of Southwest St. Andrew in the 1974 local government election. Then, surprising many, she became member of parliament for Southwest St. Andrew after defeating the JLP's Pernell Charles in the 1976 general election. In 76, the PNP needed a candidate in a very strong JLP seat just to hold the place. So she wasn't taken seriously? Absolutely not seriously. She was just a placeholder. She won the seat. She surprised everybody, and she never gave up that seat. Stick by me, I'll stick by me. On an editorial note, between 1983 and 1989, Mrs. Simpson Miller was not a member of parliament as the PNP had boycotted the 1983 general election. After becoming member of parliament, she held the portfolios of labor, tourism, sports and local government before becoming prime minister as minister of local government she once abstained from a vote because she disagreed with a decision by her government she was caught in a difficult position because she was the minister um, responsible for the fire brigade what was happening as i recall was it was during a, a, a consideration of the budget by the standing finance committee and the opposition had moved a motion to increase the provision that was being allocated for the fire brigade, because the fire brigade was in bad shape, needed equipment and so on. And she, she was caught in a difficult position because the government of resisted and opposed the, the, the motion. Because, you know, once you start pulling a, a budget apart, once you start saying, well, I give more here, that more has to come from somewhere, so you have to decide on where do you take it from. And if you take it from there, somebody's going to come and say, well, give more over here. So governments tend not to want to entertain any changes to the budget, because the budget is very painstakingly put together. And once you start changing the numbers, you can change the whole structure of the budget. So the government opposed it. She's a member of the government. But she's also the minister responsible for the fire brigade, and she was caught in a lie. So she support the government and say, no, no more money for the fire brigade. Or does she say, well, yes, the fire brigade needs more money because she knows next week she probably has to go meet with the fire brigade and she may have to explain to them, well, why, who, how, how do you take that position? She, uh, she, 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 she decided to abstain. In Jamaican politics, a government minister abstaining from voting with her government is almost unheard of. And I remember she was wrongly abused in the corridors of parliament for it. Thank you. By one of her colleagues, one of her ministerial colleagues, wrongly abused. Um, so that took courage. That colleague was Katie Knight. <laughs> In 2006, Forbes magazine ranked Portia Simpson Miller 89th on the list of 100 most powerful women in the world. She has three honorary doctorates. But despite the honors she received at home and abroad, Portia Simpson Miller faced blistering criticisms throughout her political career. Criticisms of her grammar. I've heard Bruce Gordon say has instead of has, and nobody says anything. Call us with those tense I've heard Prime Minister Andrew Wood also say, you know, something out of sync. Poor Sharon being criticized every time she made a mistake with our grammar. We were saying, you know, she's a vice president and not the vice president without some kind of certification. I think it got to her. Mrs. Simpson Miller holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in public administration. She also completed the executive program for leaders in development at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And yet, 
an issue that has always surrounded poetry was this idea of her intellectual inferiority, for want of a better way of putting it, when compared with the people around her. So, you know, you had a Peter Phillips with a doctorate. Uh, you had the KD Knights, uh, distinguished attorneys, and so on. A lot of that was a narrative of conjured up by opponents of the party, the political opponents of the party. Yeah, but the same people had to blame us for that. What we're doing was playing, was reproducing comments that had been made about her by people like Katie Knight. There were people who did it. We, did, we couldn't dare. We couldn't dare make that kind of comment about her. Um, we should have been regarded as offensive, as bigoted, and so on. Um, but our campaign did take advantage of some of the statements that our own people had made about her, you know. Fish come from her, but I'm telling you, the alligator don't they believe him, no? Um, I don't think we can be blamed for that. That is, uh, that's far for the political court. Mr. Golding is right. Many of the criticisms came from her own party. Writing about the 2006 leadership race, Reverend Garnet Roper said, party conduct had sunk to a new low. He quoted Katie Nett's comments that Mrs. Simpson Miller needs questions three hours beforehand in order to be able to answer. A narrative was painted about her, of course, because the people who, and it can be painted about anybody, because the people who should guard you and guard your weak areas, expose it. So leadership is not one person sitting in a chair being perfect. Leadership is a group of people working together and the leader is the front man or woman, right? And I don't think her team had her back. When your team don't have your back and they, really, and they, and they, and they make sure they show up to your enemy or to the competitors what your weakness is, that's where they're going to strike. It is so unfortunate that people had this view of her because I think that you remember, and she says it all the time, she's a poor little girl from Woodhall, and people just put her, there are some people who just put her in a box, and it didn't matter what level of success she had. There were people who refused to take her out of the box. And the truth is that she's very, very intelligent. She had challenges in terms of painting a vision. I mean, she, she could address the emotions. I mean, she could stir up somebody who has problems in feeding his children. But she had difficulty in conveying to that person what things would be like 10 years on the road. And that is what I think her to lose the 2016 election because that was Andrew Bonnet's issue. Her leadership style was also criticized. She was seen as not taking charge. It's a criticism she rejected. Mr. Simpson Miller, you would be aware that at least some of your critics question your intellectual capacity to lead over the past four years. For the most part, it's been Dr. Peter Phillips and Dr. Omar Davies leading the charge for the opposition in Parliament. Instead of now running ads trying to persuade the public of your leadership capabilities, why didn't you use the past four years of weekly parliamentary sittings to more effectively lead and engage in policy debates? I certainly participated in the Parliament, but I am not a one-band one person. I am the leader of the team. And I give my team the opportunity to perform and to participate. I do not believe in the Jamaican language hogging the show. No one could say they didn't get a chance to express themselves. But uh, another consequence of it was that they often went on were quite lengthy meetings. Lengthy, but she was in control. The party and the 
the members of the cabinet were all respectful of each other and most of all of her position as leader. I just want to say, what be unto the liars? Towards the end of her political career, after her defeat in the 2016 general election, this was the office occupied by Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller, the office of the leader of the opposition. It's now occupied by the man I'm about to speak to, Mark Golding. From my point of view, I thought she was an excellent leader as Prime Minister because she didn't try to micromanage anybody's ministry. She let her ministers do their work, and if they needed help, needed her political capital in any way over any issue, her, she had an open door and she was always willing to assist. Leaders bring different things to the table. I mean, the most eloquent speakers don't necessarily make the, the best leaders or the greatest leaders. I don't think you can judge somebody on um, how eloquent they are. I think you have to judge them by the genuineness of their, um, their intentions and their actions and the kind of leadership that they provide. And I think she did that in other ways. Yeah. Mrs. Simpson Miller conceded in 2011 that eloquence was never her strength. I do not have the gift of yam. So if that's what they're looking for, they will not get. I'm a practical person. I believe in Jamaica. I believe in the people of Jamaica. And what I say will be what I mean. That may have contributed to criticisms about her insistence on sticking to her scripts when delivering speeches. When you're in a sort of situation where you are constantly being criticized, both for your acumen and for your delivery, you want to ensure that you have control over your circumstance. Yeah? So you want to ensure that you have your material and that you are able to deliver it with confidence. And if that is to have that material, um, you know, encapsulated in a speech, then that's what that is. I asked Comrade Simpson in the more than once, why she need a speech? Because she's just so good at speaking on her feet. And she says, Jen, when I say anything, people must be able to go back and fact check it. You could think of that Portia is easily led. She has to understand why. You have to convince her. People underrate, they talk about emotion, intelligence. I have seen Portia take her speeches, read through them, and when she's finished with them, it is 50% different. She cuts out, she says, no, no, you're not for that. Right? People will say, and I heard it, that all she do is read from speeches. I mean, I've had the experience of preparing sections during her campaign and watching her literally editing it, taking out this, putting this. And you got the impression that people were seeking to find ways to embarrass her and to trip her up and to, um, to get her into compromising positions. And um, it, 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 it was a challenge. You said people affected you, you felt even those around her felt but at the time uh, what would you think? We, were, we were all affected. Mrs. Simpson Miller acknowledged that she was affected by some of the comments. In a 2016 Gina interview, she said what hurt most was, quote, when they said I couldn't read. People carry our young onion to the dirt. I just still stand in and still hold up our head high. How much are we female can take it as a female? Drag her name to the church, things what she not do. Then bring her down, you know, remember say, from both parts bring her down. And to still hold up her head, I Also criticized her conduct. She could lose control at times. And she could find herself in situations where, where it would come at all on her. I mean, for example, uh, that speech she made in Portmore about the only show. Is something that you know was repeated time and time again. Mr. Golding was referring to a speech in which she took on her detractors. I'm drawing my tongue! I don't show this man! Because I don't fret a no man, no, yeah, no! It resonated with the crowd. No, she was afraid of why I don't die. She was on a political platform and she communicated to people. 
that she had nothing to hide. She was to say, oh, I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of any man, any woman. I have nothing to hide. That is what she said in Parliament. On a political platform with a crowd, we're not afraid of no girl, we're not afraid of no boy. There is nothing wrong with what she said. And I said, it is a pretentious middle class who had an issue. Yeah. Yeah, they look a fool for a lad. I think it's a classist, sexist, let me tell you the truth. You know, if, if I, don't, I don't see her doing anything on stage that my mother wouldn't have done. You know what I mean? Or me wouldn't do. You know, like, a Jamaican do have certain behavior for certain occasions. I would not use that as any basis to judge her stewardship or leadership as a leader and as a prime minister. But that may be her own supporter's view, but then uh, uh, the person who's trying to make up his mind who to vote for and who to support, bearing in mind that so much of that inclination to vote is determined by the leadership, the leadership factor. But Paul Burke insists there was hypocrisy in the outrage. And I hear Michael Manley say, I'm sorry, if them think them bad, if them think them bad, test me. I've heard Michael Manley say that, but it's never born out. If them think them bad, everybody said, you better know you in your proper English. It was double standard. Pretty straight double standard. It's not whether or not you are a ghetto girl. It is uh, it is what signal you are sending about the extent to which you will go to correct what you perceive as wrong. So there may have been, and I believe there generally were concerns about the comment. Um, I have not heard Portia use it again, which means that she she took the comments and the criticisms sufficiently seriously that she was prepared to adjust her um our public pronouncements. Though proverbially we know, Chancellor, that Duppy know who to frighten. As Portia herself has reminded us, she has developed a toughness after years in the political trenches that no boy, no girl, no one can test. In September 2017, over 15 years after making that statement, Mrs. Simpson Miller could laugh out loud at those infamous words. But Nadine Spence says the controversy pointed to a deeper issue. It was unnecessary, and again, as I said to you, it, the way I frame it is, if, if another political actor had gone on stage and had performed that way, whether it was... Edward Siaga demonstrating his prowess as a man who could still impregnate a woman. Nobody would, well, I mean, people spoke about it, but the way it, it, it wasn't a, it didn't, it didn't create the same kind of impact on him, the way it did on him. And part of what that is, is about how we view men and women differently. The G2K used the clip from the statement in campaign ads. And the JLP in their campaign, you know, used it and they distorted her facial image to make it look worse and so on. I, I remember all that. But to me, that was just a moment that, uh, you know, you know wasn't, she wasn't at her best. In December 2011, Professor Carlin Cooper wrote, Sissy P's image was digitally enhanced, quote unquote, to make the then Prime Minister look as if she was stark staring mad. The commercial worked beautifully. Even hardcore PNP supporters were duped by the dishonest JLP advertisement, which appealed to rank class prejudice. Portia Simpson Miller's fearless use of the Jamaican language and her fiery disposition turned her into a viriago. She added sarcastically, she was obviously disqualified to be prime minister since she could not represent Jamaica with dignity on the world stage. Mrs. Simpson Miller believed a lot of the criticisms stemmed from classism and colorism. She told Erica Virtue in that 2016 Gleaner interview, Had my mom been the Portia, she would have been loved and respected. She would have had the right color, the right length hair, but the poor black girl from Woodhall must go through some things. Paul Burke agreed. Class and color. All right? Color as distinct from race, because we are all African people. But color complexion has consciousness and consciousness. 
Even though it's made of politics, and then the people say, I shall pass it. Portia had all th three things going against her. She was not from the right class, she was not of the right gender, and she was not of the right color. How dare her? How dare her being leader of the Great People's National Party and a leader of Jamaica? President. If I lose, what kind of question are you asking? If I lose, do I look like a loser? She was a, a, a media person's delight because at every at every meeting, at every encounter, persons like you would be anticipating a story. Despite Mr. Samuda's view, there were questions about how she handled the media. What's the rationale behind the reinstatement of Richard Azan? You asking, you're asking me about the project. If I answer you on Richard, that's what you're going to carry this evening. I want the project to be carried. No, I'm going to carry both of them. But no, what's, no, no, no. what's the rationale behind the reinstatement? I want the project. Uh, the DPP ruled that he did nothing that was criminal. That but the opposition has been saying. Going to happen. I am not concerned about what the opposition said. They have their own problems right now to fix. But they're saying it's not in line with Don't you push the microphone in line. Don't do it. I'm trapped in the world. Don't do it. What are you doing? No, she's talking to me. No, she's talking to me. I have trapped the world. I've traveled the world. And let me tell you, from I've been minister till I'm prime minister, and the media internationally, not one have ever been rude to me. And they have always treated me reversely. Her unwillingness to engage, particularly with the media, um, you know, sh she wouldn't, she would have press conferences, for example, and take questions. And when she did face questions, sometimes her responses could have been more thoughtful. I think, for example, to respond to questions about traffic guru, don't ask me, ask the PNP. Conveys to people either an impression of either being lost in the issue or seeking to hide, you know, which people don't appreciate. There are issues, but one of the issues was Porsche used to complain that she didn't like what sections of the media. What she should make a speech and the media would take out a section and she didn't believe that was the relevant section, not what she was trying to get across. There is a need for some basic understanding of news values and how journalism works. So there we have a set of seven news values that are used to help to determine uh, what reporters get out of specific assignments. And so when reporters go to these assignments, they're trying to figure out what is the most newsworthy element from a 50-minute speech. We obviously can't carry 50 minutes of content, and that is then put into a two-minute news story or even three-minute. That's what journalism is, though. When I work for them, when I do public relations, you, you listen to any statement or any speech or whatever information you have, and you extract the most newsworthy aspects of it, not the parts that her handlers think are going to best reflect or cast the best reflection on her or anybody else for that matter. There were concerns her handlers shielded her from the media. There are reports of five persons, five of your senior officers, who may have not turned over donations to your party. Do you know who those five people are? I really don't know. How do you not know? I'll spark a question. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because if the people who donate did not call to say this, I don't know. I wouldn't know. No, but I don't know what foolishness to go. The leader has already indicated to you that the, the report that was tabled was not accepted by the NEC. Therefore, the leader can be commenting on five persons. There were no new, there, there are unsubstantiated allegations. No, but you she's are muddying the waters. No, but she's, okay. she's about to answer the question. So no, no, no. 
No. I don't think we did. I, I, I think she had, you know, this is a discussion that that actually needs to be had between the the media and and um, the political process, the political communication process, because I think that there are different expectations of communication, and I think the 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 journalistic fraternity want sometimes to have access in the kind of way that they dictate, and the um, communication. Uh, process wants to be able to ensure that they can manage that process in a way that suits um, them and their principles. I think it was a perception that she was being hidden and it was not necessarily so. No, there are clear um, um, attempts to shield her. We, we even saw it uh, in the, the, there was an interview some years ago with um, young Vashon Brown when he just came in into journalism. It blew up into one incident when it ought not to have been. You know, if you watch that interview, you realize that Mrs. Simpson Miller was willingly engaging at the beginning until it became uncomfortable when questions about the Richard Azan matter started and her team intervened. It's not an issue of opinion, you know. She held no press conferences for the last part of her prime ministerial tenure. I actually did a story on that based on access to information requests, trying to compare how many conferences she had with how many um, Bruce Golding had had. I, I didn't get all the information, but it was clear that she wasn't having any. Uh, I think that, that, that could have been definitely handled differently and better. And I think, you know, going forward, there, there should have been, a, you know, whether it is a weekly, bi-weekly, a monthly, kind of set time where the Prime Minister would speak to the media and, and give a briefing, I think that should have been done. Um, I think it's always important to have access, um, not uncontrolled, but in a managed way. And I think that definitely was something that I think that didn't help, you know, that, that view that she was not accessible to the media, that didn't help at all. I thought Mrs. Simpson Miller could have done a far better job of interacting with the press without the interference of our handlers. I thought they were the ones in many cases running interference and making her look incompetent when in many cases I think she would have done a fine job handling herself. I think Portia should have been allowed to just be Portia. Just be herself. Um, every time she was herself, she would be in the support of a lot of people. And sometimes even those who did not support her politically um, would, would warm to her and quote some of the things that she said. Persons who were close to uh, Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller underestimated um, the strength of that woman, uh, how well she could articulate uh, a point, and um, they did her a disservice, I think. Most of the contribution did they and her handlers play in that perception and narrative, and, 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 and I guess fact that you're now explaining that she wasn't having press conferences, but she would have a media team, and do you think her team perhaps are on her public failure in that regard? I think so. I think so. Um, the, the, the purpose of having handlers, having, having a team around you is not to show off your strength, it's to make up for your weaknesses, um, to be able to prepare you. For example, press conferences, I mean, her team could have prepared her for press conferences. They could have managed those press conferences. Nadine Spence believes the unending policing and criticizing took a toll. You could see it after a while that she'd been so beaten down that it took a toll on her confidence. It affected her. I think at times I used to caution her say, don't give up a victim mentality. Mrs. Simpson Miller occasionally drew on the talents of her constituents to lift her spirit. Tuffy used to sing for her. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. She loved that one. Because I know she go to her whole heap. What are you to even do? Our colleagues, some of our colleagues, them run her, pretend love her. And you know, we not hide nothing. Everybody knows she get a rough time. You understand? She not get it easy. So we always have a little song that we cheer her up. And she love it. And she always say, yeah, Tuffy. Let yeah, me come and sing that one if I feel like I'm ready for the battlefield. From the
And she did face many political battles. After defeating Dr. Omar Davis, Dr. Peter Phillips, and Dr. Carl Blythe in 2006 in a bruising leadership contest to replace P.J. Patterson, in 2007, Mrs. Simpson Miller lost the general election by five seats, the JLP led by Bruce Golding winning 33 to 27. Just over a year later, she was forced to defend her position in an unprecedented challenge by Dr. Peter Phillips. It was hurtful. In a release, Mrs. Simpson Miller said, This is the first time in our history that a sitting president of the party is being challenged, and in the year of her 70th anniversary, no less. Though she won, the party was damaged. It is obvious. A house divided against itself cannot stand. So, unity of purpose, unity of message, unity of effort, those three things have to be combined to gain electoral success and to perform the mission for which this great party was created. There remained an underbelly of dissatisfaction about her leadership. Supporters of Dr. Phillips were bitter. And what the delegates have done today is an absolute disaster for the People's National Party. I was born and bred a comrade from the day I came out of my mother's womb. I was a comrade, both parents are, so they can't tell me who I am. But what I'm certain of is that they are making sure that I don't want to say it. I will never become a member of the Labour Party, but I'm certain of one thing. The Labour Party will be in power for a long, long time. You have a good night. Whenever anybody... And not only that, on either side of the of that internal political divide, um, went beyond the norms of acceptability. I think both I and she would have indicated our our um, objection to what was said. But Dr. Phillips now feels his 2008 challenge was ill-timed. In hindsight, I think it probably unlocked a uh, uh, Pandora's box, uh, unlocked a kind of uh, set of understandings, eroded a set of understandings about challenges to party leaders, which probably caused a period of turbulence, which I think even to this day, the party has not quite overcome. In 2016, 10 years after she defeated Dr. Davis, Phillips and Blythe to become the first woman president of the People's National Party, Mrs. Simpson Miller was again challenged by Dr. Carl Blythe. She handily defeated him by more than 2,000 votes. But despite her years at the helm of the party, colleagues say the former Prime Minister has not received sufficient recognition for her achievements in office. I still haven't seen the focus and how she saved the economy of this country as leader. Jamaica successfully completed an IMF program under Mrs. Simpson Miller's leadership and became the post country for the fund. She succeeded in doing something which has not been fully appreciated by Jamaica. And that is to put Jamaica on a sound economic footing to permit her Minister of Finance to implement the policies that made it possible for Jamaica to exit a second time the clutches of the IMF. I have all the time in the world for her, and I say simply, respect is due because she has earned it. For Nadine Spence, Mrs. Simpson Miller's primary shortcoming in leadership related to lawmaking. 
I would have liked to see more in terms of the legislative agenda for, trans, for transformation. I think I would have liked to see more in terms of the policy agenda for transformation for women. You know, like, for example, one groundbreaking legislation that was passed on in 1975 was equal pay. But we've not had a policy. So even though we have legislation, it's just legislation. Legislation needs action, you know? Um, I would have liked to see more shelters. We're still fighting for more shelters. So, you know, there are some tangible ways in which I would have liked to see that leadership manifested for women and children. But could Mrs. Simpson Miller have achieved more as Prime Minister without the constant battles, especially within her party? Absolutely. I, I believe that if everybody had rallied behind her being the first uh, female, because I, I never see her doing anything that was going to threaten the Jamaican state. I never saw her doing anything that was unconstitutional or illegal. Uh, and so, you know, I believe that we, we should, as a country, as a society, give her greater support. This brings us back to Professor Cooper's article. She further noted, I'm surprised that the PNP did not counter that fraudulent depiction of Portia Simpson Miller with compelling images of her commanding presence at global meetings, such as those of the International Labour Organization and other transnational forums at which she often receives standing ovations for her stirring speeches. Which begs the question, did the PNP fail Portia Simpson Miller? As her friend I believe so. Do I think the PNP failed her? That's an existential question. And it's, it can be answered in many different ways. What I want to focus on is that she gave her best. She gave her life. She gave her soul and her spirit. Former Prime Minister Bruce Golding lays some blame at the feet of her advisors. One of the real pitfalls of leadership is surrounding yourselves and putting your trust in people who tell you what you want to hear, who greet you every morning with lavish phrases, and who feel that it could be out of place for them to sit you down and tell you the naked truth. Do you think she suffered from that? I think so. I think so. I think so. I think they failed her from the beginning. Why? Um, because they didn't fight fairly with her. I think they threw, they threw everything at her. They threw, if you were going to fight in respect, fight her as a, in respect of what you thought, you know, she is a better leader. Then you question her on the components of leadership. How do you manage a team? You know, that kind of thing. But I don't think the fight against her was limited to her leadership. It, it, it got into her personality, it got into her, whether or not she could do the job, it got into, it got into everything. Mrs. Simpson Miller arrived at this polling station in her constituency sometime after nine this morning, ready to mark her ex. In 2016, Mrs. Simpson Miller led the PNP to another general election loss. Calls for her to step aside began to mount. Towards the end, it was clear that you know she had reached a stage in her life and her career where she would be phasing out of public life. That's never an easy situation. Uh, especially when the successor uh, and the issues around it, who would succeed and so on, haven't, aren't, aren't fully resolved. So I know that there were things going on uh, within the party that may not have appeared to be uh, appropriate or sufficiently respectful of the stature that she had and what was due to her. So. But I wouldn't attribute that to the party as such, and I think that there were some elements that maybe were too hasty in seeking her, you know, to transition to the new leader, perhaps. She didn't retire with the kind of grace and dignity that she perhaps deserved. But then again, party leaders 
that need to know when to go. She ought to have been given an opportunity to step away in the way that she wanted to do. She should have announced in 2016 that as soon as the local government elections were over, she was stepping down. It was always her intention. She was not going to hold on to power, but not announcing it. That is speculation. What she faced at the end is not unique to her or to Jamaica. Former Prime Minister Edward Siaga also faced calls to step down. So too Patrick Manning in Trinidad and Tobago. Since retiring in 2017, Mrs. Simpson Miller has made a few public appearances, but her impact remains. She's one of a kind. Well, very one of a kind. Very weird to find somebody like she. You see us? A one of a kind. That's why you see all the things that happen for her. Happen for her. She become the first female Prime Minister because she deserves it. I believe she's one of a kind in certain ways, but I hope that she is not the only one of that kind. In women's studies, we say the personal is political, and that's what she got. That politics is a is personal sport. That if you touch people's hearts, you shake them hand. Right, and people trust you, and she knew that. There won't be another Portia. You know, she's a special person. For Portia Simpson Miller, her, her legacy uh, will be in the sense of how she got people to, to, to see themselves as being able to achieve coming from difficult circumstances. Um, and I think that, that is going to be our enduring legacy. And again, her message, her theme of looking out for the poor, loving the poor. The Andrew Hollis administration plans to honor Mrs. Simpson Miller. You know, she should be uh, memorialized and, and uh, um, recognized uh, through, you know, through various symbols. And we do you have any ideas that. in mind? That you was not ideas. We're working on things that uh, I think she she would be quite pleased with. Care to share any of that parameter? At the appropriate time. It's a gesture that may help highlight the legacy of one of Jamaica's most loved, but also most criticized political figures. I have played my part and run my leg of the relay of representation and service to my country. My dear legacy. The lives I have changed for the better. The disappointments I turned to triumphs and the hopelessness to hope. I pray that those who, whose lives I have touched in any way are changed for the better will do the same for someone else. I hope that the seeds of hope I have planted will continue to grow into large trees and bear fruits for generations to come. Giovanni Dennis for Television Jamaica.